Brian Dorries, welcome to the show. No, thanks so much. So you're the founder of a production company called Theater of War, where you put on and perform ancient Greek tragedies, but you also wrote about the experience in a book called The Theater of War, What Ancient Tragedies Can Teach Us Today. Let's talk about your history with tragedies. When did you discover that you would be performing tragedies for different groups of people, soldiers, addicts, prisoners? How did you figure that out? Well, it was a gradual process. I studied classics as a student, undergraduate at Kenyon College in Ohio. And when I left school, I knew that there was a larger audience for these plays than the rarefied few of us who had the privilege of studying them. And had always believed that those who had lived the extremities of life, even if they'd never heard of these plays, might have something to say about them. And I got to test that theory out back in 2007 when I directed a series of readings of plays by Sophocles in hospitals And it became pretty apparent after the first performance when we engaged the audience of doctors and medical students and patients in a discussion that they, in fact, knew more about the play than I did, even though I translated it from ancient Greek. And that was the first major revelation that set us, the company, on this path. It was the first major revelation that, you know, open the door to the work that we've been doing now, this core value that the audience with skin in the game, the audience that has loved and lost and been betrayed and knows sacrifice, that has witnessed suffering and death, has more to teach us about these ancient Greek plays than we to teach them. So we started in hospitals, and it was an avocation then, something I was doing on the side of my professional life. And then in 2007, the Walter Reed scandal broke. You may recall that was when our nation's flagship medical army hospital, military hospital, was sort of exposed in a Washington Post uh, story that showed how grossly underfunded and under-resourced it was to receive our troops returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. And on every you know, paragraph and every part of that article, I saw themes in the ancient plays that we'd already been performing in hospitals and just got this idea that if I could simply put ancient war plays uh, about the Trojan War that dealt with many of the themes I know that are, or I had a hunch that our service members and veterans were struggling with, that if I could put those ancient war plays in front of contemporary warriors, that something would happen. I didn't know what it was. And it was that hunch that led us to start seeking a military audience. And um, I didn't know anyone in the military when we got started. I didn't know how to talk to people in the military. I'd grown up in a military town in Newport News, Virginia, but I didn't um, know anyone active duty. And to be frank, I'd protested against the invasion of Iraq in the streets of New York, and it felt pretty ineffective. And it just, it struck me that in, in reading this story in the, in the Washington Post about veterans returning to substandard conditions at Walter Reed, that if we were complicit in the suffering of our veterans, if we ignored their suffering, that we would not have learned any of the lessons that our country had to learn during the Vietnam conflict. And it, you, one couldn't simply protest against the war and then sit on one's hands when faced with the suffering of veterans, the only thing to do was to try to engage with them and help. And all I had was Greek and Latin and a hunch, but it turned out it was, it was a, that we had stumbled across a very powerful ancient tool that was designed by warriors for warriors to do the very thing that we ended up doing with it. Well, we'll dig deeper into that experience and then how you've also branched out to other areas as well, to other groups. But before we do, let's talk about tragedies in general, because I'm sure a lot of our audience, they probably had to read one or two tragedies in high school, Greek tragedies. Yeah. But just get a big picture overview, like who were the great, I guess they're, what are they called? Tragedy writers? Tra- tragedians? Tragedians? What do you say? <laughs> Tragedians, Tragedians is what you would say, yeah. There were three great tragic writers in fifth century Athens. There were others as well, but the main ones were... Aeschylus, known as the sort of father of Greek tragedy, Sophocles and Euripides. And during the 5th century BC, alongside the rise of democracy 
in the Western world arose a form of storytelling that at its core is inextricably democratic as well. And tragedies involve stories about people with somewhat noble intentions learning too late of their own mistakes or blindness to the very thing in front of them that if they had known, they certainly wouldn't have done. And unfortunately, usually milliseconds too late, they learn of their mistakes and end up destroying themselves and generations to come. That's what happens on the stage in Greek tragedy. But one of the contentions of our work is that there's a big difference between what happens in the plays and what the plays evoke in audiences. And I would contend that ancient Greek tragedy is a form of storytelling that was designed to do several really important things. One, to communalize trauma. So the Greeks saw nearly 80 years of war during the 5th century BC, and the audience would have been made of citizens, and the citizens were by virtue of 100% compulsory service, they were also soldiers. And so there was no one in the audience when presented with stories about the Trojan War that would have missed the themes, the real life, life and death stakes of the themes that were being performed for them. And there's a theory that, you know, the audience was seated according to tribe, which is your military unit, you fight with your community, and according to rank with the generals in the front row, the Stratagoi and the hoplite cadets in the nosebleed section in the very back, and that 17,000 people would sit in this outdoor amphitheater on the south slope of the Acropolis every spring, and for three days they would watch these tragic plays by the three authors I mentioned and others, one after the other depicting trauma and loss and grief and betrayal and suffering and and characters, as I mentioned, learning too late and then discovering in the sort of final moments of the plays how they've erred and the mistakes they've made and the habits they've formed that have accrued to become essentially what we now call fate. And so this is what the, what happened in the fifth century. And I think what we've missed about it is this isn't a form of storytelling that was simply born to entertain. It was inextricably civic, religious. There was a huge religious ceremony that was enacted at the beginning of every city Dionysia theater festival each spring. It was uh, legal. This is the same theater where, where people saw plays. It was a place where people went to hear the rhetorical arguments of lawyers and, and uh, politicians. It was a theater uh, for warriors and those who'd experienced war. It was inextricably all these things and more. And when we see a Greek play, unfortunately, I think most of the time we think togas and sandals and sheets and people worshiping gods that no longer exist. And sort of people often using translations that are from the 19th century, or at least sound like they're from the 19th century, filled with antiquated language. But these Greek plays were direct, efficacious experiences for those who watched them in the 5th century. And I would argue that the stakes of watching them were of life and death for those who were there. Because the Greeks knew that there had to be a time, there had to be a place where those who'd experienced war and trauma, and even at the end of the fifth century, a plague, a pestilence like we're living through today that killed one third of the Athenian population, there had to be a time and a place to collectively acknowledge the impact of violence and of trauma and of loss on individuals, but also on the community. And so the Greek plays, these ancient tragedies, weren't simply expressions of fatalism or grief on the part of the Greeks who were living through these experiences. They were gestures that were meant to acknowledge the collective toll these experiences had and to provide people the opportunity to see their own struggles reflected in ancient stories. The Greeks were up to the same thing we're up to now. They were telling stories about the Trojan War, which was as distant in their memory collectively in their consciousness as they are to us today. So you said like a tragedy happens when a character realizes something. It's called, I guess that's peripatia, right? Where they, or agnorasis, <laughs> yeah. when they discover something too late and they, they do something that causes their downfall. And like sort of the stereotypical, like 
I guess, platonic form of tragedy that a lot of people point to is Oedipus Rex or Oedipus Rex, if you're from England, <laughs> right. pronounce it that way. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so like Oedipus, he had a temper, ended up killing his father and sleeping with his mother. And he just, he realized it when it was too late. Yeah, I mean, it's so actually, it's not Platonic; it's the Aristotelian. So Plato threw right. out all of the poets from the ideal yeah, republic. Plato didn't. Yeah, he thought they corrupted the corrupted people. He believed, yes, and this is an important point. He believed that, or his 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 character Socrates, based on the historical figure, argued that the reason the poets shouldn't be in in the republic, they should be banned, is because they have the capacity to sway our emotions and make us do things we we shouldn't do or or don't want to do. And while everything from ancient theater to contemporary advertising certainly plays upon those principles, I think there was something hugely missed in that gesture. And that's that we can have the ethical conversations all day, all night about, and the policy conversation. But Unless we're grounded in the emotional and spiritual consequences of our ethical decisions and our policy decisions, I think it's easy to lose touch with what we're really talking about. And that's what the Greek plays did. Watching characters suffer on stage because of decisions they make in front of us brings us into a consciousness of our own choices and their consequences, as well as the fleeting possibility of making a change before it's too late. So Aristotle says, yes, the, I mean, again, Aristotle has a bunch of words that have been filtered down to us through high school English teachers, mostly. And with all due respect to them, I, unfortunately, for most of us, we were kind of poisoned to Greek tragedy by those lessons. And to, you know, the ones you mentioned, Peripatia and and anagnorosis are recognition and reversal, right? So this idea that um, when you're watching a Greek tragedy, you watch characters learn something and then change their behavior, but often too late. And in the case of Oedipus, yes, he learns over the span of the play that he is the source of the contagion, the very plague that's killing the people of Thebes. Because, yes, he has fulfilled a prophecy that he sought to escape, that he would one day marry his mother and kill his father. Those things happened before the play began. So the real action of the play is the discovery of the thing that he was blind to all along. In the Greek, I am the contagion. But the interesting thing about tragedy, you mentioned it explores this idea of fate, but also like you know, personal responsibility, like the intersection between the two. Because a lot of times the stuff that happens like to the person that's like the tragic hero or tragic character, like they didn't have, like it just sort of like they got dealt a bad hand. Like, you know, Oedipus, like there was some prophecy. He had no control over that. And, and he had no clue that the things he was doing was fulfilling this prophecy. Yeah. But yet he was still responsible for it. So like, how right. did the Greeks, so, like what was going um, on there? Yeah, so uh, Aristotle takes, uh, for some reason, Oedipus and uses it as the ultimate example of Greek tragedy. I, again, this these Aristotle's poetics, which is what we're really talking about right now, were like a pocket notebook of, of Aristotle's with lecture notes scrawled into it. Not a book, not a study, not an essay, but just some notes he had written. And somehow they've been sort of codified and just frame our understanding. Like words like catharsis, which to me mean absolutely nothing, become the key words we use to talk about Greek tragedy. And fate is another one of those words and tragic flaw is the other one, which I try to talk about in my book. I think you're really right to point out that the Greek plays are very much about agency. And they're also about forces at work in our lives that are bigger than us that we don't necessarily understand until it's too late. We have lots of forces working upon us every day. You know, gods, governments, luck, chance, diseases, weather. And, uh, you know, are we as human beings conscious of all those forces and their impact upon us all the time? Of course not. Um, but we still have agency. We're still responsible for our choices. And I think the thing that Oedipus actually suffered from that he didn't deserve is not the prophecy. He ran from the prophecy and by virtue of running from it, he fulfilled it. And there's something in that. It's actually the fact that he was exposed or aborted as a child. His name, Oedipus, means pierced foot or pierced feet. It also means I know feet, because in, in Greek, the past tense of I have seen 
is I know, I have known, foot. So Oedipus has, is named after the very act by which he was aborted, exposed on the side of a mountain on account of a prophecy that his parents had received that King Laius, his father, would be killed by his own offspring. And that early childhood trauma ends up defining his life. And it isn't until the very last seconds of the play when he realizes that his own mother had given him away and his father had tried to kill him on the side of a mountain and then on the side of a road. And that Oedipus responded at that moment with overwhelming force and violence and killed the person who was trying to kill him. But everything in his life that he wasn't really conscious of had led him to this place where he would react with such violence. And I think there's an insight in, uh, of course, Freud uncovers this and plays with it. And, you know, whole dissertations and books have been written about this notion that how we are treated as children by our parents in some ways is the intergenerational curse that gets passed down from generation to generation. And we performed Oedipus a few years ago in a supermax prison at Eastern Correctional Facility, where I taught a class on tragedy with 27 inmates who were all doing 25 years to life for violent, mostly violent crimes. And they wanted to talk about, when they heard and saw the play in the prison, the sins of the father. They wanted to talk about Laius and how Oedipus's father's violence toward him as a child and as an adult shaped who Oedipus was. But even so, they wanted to talk about personal responsibility for their own crimes. Many of them were abused as children, and yet that didn't excuse the violence that they had committed in their lives. And therein lies, I think, what's so powerful about Greek tragedy. It's not about morals. It's not about lessons. It is about ambiguity. It is about the moral grayness in which we're all living. Are we responsible for our actions? Absolutely. Are we sometimes victims of forces that are well beyond our understanding? Of course. So how do we, how do we reconcile those two things, especially when it comes to things like violent crimes? And so that's one of the core themes of the play. No, I mean, if you read all the tragedy, that seems like to be that, that ambiguity is the, the reoccurring theme. And, you, and a lot of them, like you see this moment where the character, the, the main character of the play like basically ask and they're asking the chorus it's basically like, what am i supposed to do like what am i yeah. supposed to do now <laughs> and yeah. i think and that's yeah. why they're so that's why they're so like people resonate because we've all had those experiences in our lives like what am i supposed to do now because like you weren't dealt you were dealt this rotten hand but you're still responsible and you're clueless about what to do that's right and maybe that's the human that's that's what it means to be human or maybe that's what it means to be an adult to be sort of almost conscious of these forces that are work at work upon us, almost able to surpass them, but ultimately, you know, it's a crapshoot. And yet we're still held responsible for what we end up doing. So, you know, I think there's another theory I really like by this guy, Jack Winkler, who was a Princeton classicist, who asserted this idea that Greek tragedy was a form of training for young adults, for sort of late adolescents called ephebes. Uh, there were 19-year-olds who were matriculating into military service, but also into civic life. And that's why, according to his theory, so many of the Greek plays feature characters who are young, the adolescents, Antigone, Orestes, Electra, Ismene, Neoptolemus, Hylas, list goes on and on, thrust into ethically impossible situations for which there are no right answers and by which they will be haunted for the rest of their lives, no matter what they decide to do. This theory about Ephebes or young people being the centerpiece of Greek tragedy even goes so far as to assert that the chorus itself may have been performed by late adolescents, so that the framing of how you heard the play and that exchange about what I should do would be seen through the lens of young people wrestling with these issues. You know, I don't think we as a society have a vehicle for training people for the moral ambiguity of adult life. But the Greeks convened one third of their Athenian population each spring to watch all these plays, if you follow this theory, to train young people for what it means to be an adult. 
And that means facing down ambiguity. Well, can we talk about the, the the dynamic between the chorus and the characters? So, like the the tragedy, like one thing that makes unique about tragedy is that it's all action, right? Like yeah. the tragedy doesn't happen unless something happens. It's not like a novel where there's like internal dialogue and there's character development. Like something has to happen, and then it seems like the chorus is there to provide context for the action. Yeah, I think, well, there's a number of functions of the chorus, but what I like about theater and what I like about tragedy in particular is you're right, it is action. There is no other thing. The action is the thing. And that's why plays don't mean anything. They do something. That's why tragedies do something. And even the word drama comes from drao in Greek means to do, to act. So you don't describe a character, you learn about a character through their choices. Oedipus makes a series of choices on stage and off, and that's what forms the character or your impression of who the character is. And I think that's, you know, that's become a sort of unwritten rule of character development anyway, that the action is the most powerful tool for understanding a character. You know, of course, in novelistic forms, other forms, you have other tools as well. Uh, The chorus is this amazing intermediary, this bridge between the world of the audience and the world of the play. And so, yes, the characters in the plays, in the scenes, often sort of turn out to the chorus in in these sort of ethically complex situations and say, what do I do? You know, in in one of the plays we recently performed, there's a character named Hillis who's been asked by his dying father, Heracles, to essentially kill him by uh, euthanizing him and burning him alive because he knows he's been poisoned and he wants to die a specific way. And Hillis's response is, if I'm loyal to you, then I am disloyal to myself and my sense of what is right. Is that the lesson that I am to learn? And he's saying it to Heracles, but he's also saying it publicly for a chorus to hear and respond to. And that's where I think we get the model of communalization, this idea that like, you know, Sometimes when you're in the military or you you are a protester or you work in a hospital or you're a caregiver for someone who's dying, you find yourself in a position where you feel you're the only person who's ever felt this alone or this much anguish at a choice that you have to make. And what Greek tragedy does is it sort of lifts those choices up out of isolation and places them in the company of other people who then, in terms of the chorus, but then the audience that's watching that the chorus is sort of the stand-in for, have to wrestle and collectively shoulder the burden of the consequences of the choice that the character ultimately makes. There are scenes in which, through dramatic irony, the audience and the chorus uh, are both sort of complicit in the suffering of a character. They're aware that they're sort of consuming the suffering of a character. And that raises all kinds of questions about our relationship to suffering. And I think you, you follow the logic of the chorus as a proxy for the larger audience all the way out into the world of the 17,000 citizen soldiers who are sitting in the theater of Dionysus. And all of a sudden, tragedy appears not to be a just an art form where people are telling stories. Um, it actually is a technology for collective healing where the message is, if there were a message, um, Hey, you know, you don't have to shoulder the burden of these decisions alone, you know, for military, we sent you to war. So you soldier, you don't have to shoulder, share the pollution of the moral ambiguity of what you did on behalf of our country with us. We'll sit here and we'll bear witness to the truth of that moral ambiguity, not by having you have to narrate it to us up on stage, but by these stories that make it easier for all of us to relate to the challenges you faced. And so all of a sudden, you know, when we perform for very diverse and mixed audiences, one sees that audience members are relieved to discover that they're not the only people on the planet to have felt this alone. And I think that's the for- folk, the 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 I think that's the purpose of the, the chorus in Greek tragedy, so that these things don't happen in a vacuum. And so that the characters can sort of, you know, share the burden and the pollution of what they're facing with other people. Well, this idea that tragedies are a technology of healing, you make this point that oftentimes the amphitheater was connected to, I guess, what we call like the doctor's office or like the temple where you'd go to get healed physically. Yeah. Like there was, a, they, they, they saw the connection there. Definitely. I mean, look, I don't, I'm not speaking as an academic or, or a scholar when I say that, but there are other people who've made this argument and some terrific 
to articles and books about the subject. You know, when I went to the theater of Dionysus for the first time, I stood in the temple of Asclepius, which is the very place where people went to get healed. And by the way, the temple of Asclepius was moved in the late fifth century directly adjacent to the theater of Dionysus. So that when you're standing in the temple, the ruins of the temple where people, the clinic where people went to be healed, you can hear because of the architecture of, uh, with the clarity of, you know, Bose noise canceling headphones, what someone's saying on the absolute other side of the amphitheater, uh, as if they, even if they're whispering, and that's not an exaggeration. If you know the architecture of, of amphitheaters, amphitheater in Greek means the place where we go to see in both directions, the amphi in both directions, teatron, seeing place. And it's where I go to see you and you go to see me and where we go to see ourselves reflected in the characters and where we go to see our own struggles reflected in ancient stories and where by virtue of the mediation of storytelling, we can see ourselves and see each other. And that that was directly adjacent to the very place where individuals went to get healed I mean, I don't need more of an argument than the work that we are already are doing, but it just seems that Greek tragedy is as refined a technology and an advancement as Greek architecture or Greek philosophy or the other huge advancements of the classical period in almost every field. And, you know, the, the, the power and the, the sort of proof of what I'm saying is that I can take a Greek tragedy, dust it off, you know, translate it into a vernacular that feels more direct than most translations, put it in front of just about any audience from any culture. And it has this, the, that, that audience almost predictably has the same response. And so it, it is a technology. It is a tool that like an external hard drive, once you plug it into the right audience, it knows what to do. And the audience does as well. So what do you think is going on with the healing process? I think you mentioned earlier, like this idea, I think a lot of people have this idea that the tragedies were healing because you get catharsis. Like you watch this really sad play, you see someone you know, have a downfall and you cry, you feel pity, you feel fear, and you sort of like puke out all your emotions. I have, a, have like a really, <laughs> like a really set, like a big, big, like messy cry. And then you can go on your <laughs> life and do your thing. Right. You don't think that's yeah. what was going on. I just think catharsis is one of those dime store words that doesn't really mean anything. And we all sort of have different definitions of it. It's sort of, it's sort of a new age word that really has taken hold in the 20th, 21st century. I don't think it means much. I'm not really interested in catharsis. I, I don't know what it okay. means. So I, I don't even know how to be interested in it. I, I, I hear that definition that it's again, in Aristotle's note, lecture notes, he wrote that the aim of tragedy was catharsis. He was writing 150 years after the 5th century dramas that I was talking about were performed in Athens. So again, he didn't have direct contact with the Sophocles, Euripides, and Aeschylus and what was actually happening. He's speculating 150 years later, and he's saying the aim is catharsis, and that's a purgation of pity and fear, a, a pure or a purification of emotion. So either it means that you throw them up, as you said, and and then, then all of a sudden you've, you've purged yourself of those, or that there's sort of a healthy balance to carry around of those emotions. Pity and fear are not necessarily negative emotions, but they have to be sort of purified through this process of collectively engaging with these stories. That's kind of interesting, but I actually think just from experience, experience and, and practical experience in terms of what we do. I'm less interested in catharsis and way more interested in something else, which is um, in the early days, I thought that performing these ancient plays for people who had experienced trauma, whether it was military or prison or sexual assault or people who'd you know, experienced death and dying or natural disasters or addiction, that what we were after by performing the plays was empathy and that's another sort of dime store, you know, nickel word. It's not, it's not really, it doesn't mean much. It's an invention of the late 19th century. What I think is critical about it is I, I went thinking that the objective was empathy and later learned that actually, well, empathy is a byproduct of performing these, these really extreme stories of people suffering and learning too late. That in fact, the most productive thing that we do is make people uncomfortable and if the actors committed to the actual level of emotion 
that's required of these by these ancient plays, they would do things that really weren't acceptable in the, the commercial or nonprofit theater and film and television. They'd do something that wasn't ultimately consumable or even appropriate in most places. They would express a sort of form of suffering that was, uh, you know, be unclear whether they were suffering or the character was suffering. Um, they would do something that would make not only people uncomfortable, but cause us all to sort of scan for the exits. And so the note that I give actors before they go on stage when they're performing Greek tragedies for audiences that have experienced trauma and loss is make them wish they'd never come. And I know that sounds sort of ridiculous and counterintuitive. I don't, I don't mean like bore them to death or cause them to leave because they're, you know, feel disconnected from the material. But what I really mean is push the performance to such a place where we're all so uncomfortable that we want to leave. And then with our model, and this didn't happen in the ancient world, at least not in the same direct way, we, we stop the performance and we have a conversation in the theater of war model that lasts just as long as the performance. Sometimes we'll only do a scene and we'll sort of just break the play and then we'll interrogate it. But if we are pushed as an audience to a place of total discomfort and this is really helpful in our current environment, this sort of politically divisive, possibly violent environment we're living in right now. No matter what divides us, at least we can share in that discomfort. We can acknowledge that we were all uncomfortable. And then in the discussion that follows in our model, we can interrogate, well, why are we so uncomfortable? What's so frightening or makes us so uncomfortable about these, these, these things that have been portrayed to us in the play? And, you know, with our model, we're not saying to the audience, this is you. We're performing these ancient texts that seem quite strange, I think, to most people. We're just creating this space where people can reflect on, well, what do you see of yourself in this? And when people are asked and invited into that process of sort of seeing themselves in an ancient story, they open up. And they connect in ways that, I mean, look, when we first got started, it was seen as a career-ending gesture in the U.S. military to raise your hand and say, I'm struggling with an invisible wound. People just wouldn't do it. I mean, Congress had appropriated billions of dollars to address the, the mental health epidemic on their hands, and yet no one was availing themselves of the resources. But we could get a, a room full of a thousand Marines just returned from Iraq or Afghanistan to open up. And short of giving those Marines a psychotropic drug, I really doubt you're going to get a thousand Marines to open up in that way. And so one has to then reckon with the fact that when I say Greek tragedy was a technology, I mean, it, 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 it is a psychotropic, mind-altering experience when actors commit to these, this sort of psychic anguish, to performing the psychic anguish that these characters are in, it changes our, our cognition. It opens us in ways that I think very few things can. And that's the thing that we've lost touch with as a culture because we've commodified storytelling. Stories are to be consumed in our culture. But what we're trying to create with Theater of War is something that can't be consumed and that makes us incredibly uncomfortable. Well, speaking of you know, doing this performance for, for veterans, the, the play you guys, you did several plays for them. The one that you, that you talk about in the book is Sophocles' Ajax. For those who aren't familiar, like, what's the big picture story of Ajax? And like, what, what did you think that story would resonate with veterans? So Sophocles' Ajax is a play about a decorated warrior named Ajax, who in the ninth year of the Trojan War, after endless fighting after losing many of his men after the sheer exhaustion of all these years of fighting loses his best friend Achilles in battle and then is betrayed by his commanding officers when they give Achilles armor to Odysseus to another man and it's the combination of exhaustion and trauma and loss and grief and then I think the final straw, betrayal, that causes Ajax to break. And Ajax is called unbendable in the Greek, sort of unbreakable. He's known to be the strongest of all Greek warriors. And now all of a sudden, in this story, the strongest of all Greek warriors snaps, and he goes and tries to kill his commanding officers while they sleep. And he's visited by a kind of dissociative 
berserk madness that's brought upon him by Athena, and he mistakes animals in the surrounding fields for the enemy, for for the people he came to kill, his the, the generals, and he he slaughters this field full of animals with the precision of a great trained warrior, and in so doing, he enters deeper into this into this dissociative and berserk state. And we, he actually begins to believe the animals he's killing are really the men he came to kill. And he drags them back to his house and tortures them in front of his wife and his son. And, and the play is about what happens when he wakes up from this madness, from this break with reality that's come from all of these, this accrual of all these conditions in which he's been living and trying to survive. And so in the play, Ajax is confronted by his family who can tell that as he's coming to consciousness of what he's done, he's thinking about taking his own life and he, they bring in his troops and they confront him and try to stop him. And, and in spite of all their efforts to sort of mount this intervention to keep Ajax from harming himself, he convinces everyone that he's okay. And he slips away with his weapon, which he was given by his enemy, Hector. Sort of Hector, and he goes down to the salt marshes by the sea and he impales himself on his enemy's sword. And, you know, this is the only instance in extant Greek tragedy where someone takes their life in this way on stage. Violence t- typically takes place in Greek tragedy off stage. And then, you know, something, something is wheeled on, uh, you know, uh, the, the scene is brought out. But th- in this instance, Ajax, this great warrior, played by an actor who would have been a combat veteran because everyone served, takes his own life on stage, impaling himself on a sword, calling out for the deaths of the generals who betrayed him, and does it only feet from the generals who were sitting in the front row of the Theater of Dionysus. And the second half of the play is about what happens after he kills himself and the impact it has on his family and his troops and his chain of command on his brother who arrives milliseconds too late and whether he should be buried or not. And that becomes the central sort of struggle and theme of the play. And I, I got to tell you, you know, we, we knew it resonate. We knew that it would touch upon themes that the military, you know, had experienced. We got our first opportunity to find out what would happen when we were invited back in 2008 to perform Ajax for 400 Marines and their spouses in San Diego and brought some well-known actors from New York and LA to perform David Sturtheron and Jesse Eisenberg and this wonderful Iraqi American actress named Heather Raffo and a just monster of an actor, New York actor named Bill Camp. And we performed it at breakneck speed and scheduled a 45 minute discussion afterwards. And the discussion lasted three and a half hours and had to be cut off at midnight. And People in that audience stood up and recited lines from Sophocles' Ajax from memory as if they'd known the play their entire lives and related what they had heard in the play to harrowing stories they had never shared in private, let alone in front of 400 of their peers in this environment in which it was seen as career ending to do so. And, you know, at one point I looked back and there were 50 people waiting to speak at the mic. And we realized at that point that we had stumbled across a very powerful ancient military tool. Sophocles was a general. Sophocles was a general in the Athenian army. He was elected general twice. I I doubt he got elected for writing plays, but who knows? And the audience was military in the ancient world. It was citizen soldiers and they were seeing they were they'd seen 80 years of war over a single century and here is a play that so explicitly speaks to the moral suffering of veterans when all of these things accrue and we've come up you know it's taken us it's taken us 2500 years to come up with an acronym like PTSD which you know barely scratches the surface of the moral and psychological and spiritual complexity of what veterans return from war and struggle with. But the plays somehow get at it without the jargon of medicine and without the psychoanalytic, you know, blah, blah. And that opens audiences up. And, you know, the invitation that we give to military audiences is, you know, talk about the play. We don't ask them to talk about themselves, but, and everyone can have a valid interpretation of the play, even if we radically disagree about what that interpretation is. And 
that creates this environment where people really come forth. And they say things like, the first person who spoke said she was a military spouse that night. And she said, hello, my name is Marcel. I'm the proud mother of a Marine, the wife of a Navy SEAL. And my husband went away four times to war. And each time he came back just like Ajax, dragging invisible bodies into our house. And to quote from the play, our home is a slaughterhouse. And when she did that in front of 400 Marines and their spouses, she gave all the spouses in the room permission to voice their hidden anguish and pain by way of the play. And that's in fact what happened. And what happens every single time we perform Ajax for people who've experienced the extremities, not just of war, but of violence and trauma, it works every time. Yeah, and that's a great example because like war is one of those things where, you know, obviously you don't like war, but if you're a soldier, it's what you signed up to do. And there's these these costs that come with it that you have the, there's like a, there's that intersection of fate and personal responsibility. And that's, that's a, that, that's a heavy, heavy, you're put in all these situations. Like, what am I supposed to do? What's the right thing to do? And the tra- tragedy, it sounds like gives them like, lets them know, like they're not alone in this. Like that's right. 2,500 years ago, Sophocles felt it. Greek soldiers felt it. This is nothing new. And there's some comfort in that, I guess. Right. I mean, that's that's the thing. If I've observed one thing over you know close to 1,800 performances across the last more than 12 years, it's that people who've experienced loss and trauma universally feel alone. Like no one could possibly understand my pain. And you hear veterans say that all the time. No one can understand what I've been through except the people who were in the exact place I was in at the exact time when this traumatic thing happened. And that is a totally understandable position to take. But I think what Greek tragedy can show us is that, well, maybe we won't understand. We can never know the material circumstances that led to your trauma. Many people have experienced things in their lives that have led them to feel the same type of isolation. And in that isolation, they can understand something deeper than just the material circumstances that led you to this place. And so we've had people, you know, in our performances, especially for diverse audiences, people on the receiving end of war, Middle Eastern people stand up and talk about their experience. We've had people who've experienced sexual trauma, people who've experienced, been kidnapped, people who have lost family members in accidents, people who have been abused. And all of a sudden in the discussion, you see that all these different communities of trauma are actually one community. It's, it's all cocentric circles rippling out of the same sort of point of impact. And we're all within those circles, even if the thing that led us to feel so alone was was different. And and I think that's really the power. It's it's actually, you can say you're not alone. That's sort of a pithy thing people say all the time. You know, you're not alone. And then the, 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 you can also, the, there's a big difference to being told you're not alone and actually realizing that in this amphitheater where I'm seeing you and you're seeing me and we're seeing ourselves reflected in these stories, you know, I'm not the only person in the room who, who feels this way. And uh, I think that's, you know, that's what Greek tragedy has to offer. It's not the only form of storytelling that can do this. There are many other ancient cultures that were after very similar ends. And it's just that the Greeks spent a great deal of resources in the 5th century BC as they were building their democracy and as they were prosecuting enormous wars they spent a great deal of their resources developing this this technology you know so we talked about i mean so if you're a veteran you know go see ajax performed so you'll probably resonate but like even if you're not a veteran there's there's a there's a tragedy probably out there that you would resonate with. Like one that connected with me uh, that you talk about in the book is that you, you mentioned earlier the scene with Heracles and his son. I think it's from Woman of Trachis or Trachis mm-hmm. where, you know, he, Heracles asks to be like, son, kill me. Now, this is all about end of life stuff. Now let's set aside the idea of like active euthanasia and assisted suicide. But family members are faced with that situation. What to do? Let's say you have a family member, a dad, partner, child. They're on assisted feeding, respiration, and you have to make that decision, like, do I pull the plug or do I not? Like, and you, don't, you there's like no right answer. You don't know what to do. 
And that, that, that scene from that tragedy, like they experienced that same feeling. Yeah, we you know we did a performance yesterday of that very scene for Doctors Without Borders, which is I'm sure you know is an organization that has doctors all over the world, inside countries where sometimes it's hard to penetrate offering free medical care. And during COVID, it's been especially sort of instrumental as an organization. And one of the doctors in the discussion really honed in on this idea that that scene really is about the moral suffering and distress of being asked to end someone's life or to help them, to aid them in dying. In in the Greek, Heracles says to his son, am I asking you to be my iater, my doctor, by burning me alive? And so in a profession where people swear an oath, a Hippocratic oath to do no harm, Many doctors and nurses and other types of medical professionals find themselves in positions, as as we do, as family members and caregivers, where we're being asked to do something or be complicit in something that we've been trained not to do, or that our moral framework, you know, tells us not to do, and yet something in us tells us that it's the right thing to do. And that struggle, that internal struggle is is one that I experienced as someone when I was in my early mid-20s when I lost my girlfriend to cystic fibrosis and was her principal caregiver over about a six-month period in the East Village in New York City. And she'd had a double lung transplant and uh, it was failing. And she had dozens of surgeries during that time and experienced a level of pain and anguish that I just didn't know it was possible. I didn't know that it was possible for life to be prolonged in such a miserable way for so long. And, and yet, in spite of that, she transcended those circumstances over and over again and found light and life and a way of living in spite of it. And as a caregiver in my early 20s, I was just sort of ill-prepared for what I was being asked to do, which was not just, you know... I mean, when you look on helplessly while someone is suffering, it's impossible, unless you're a psychopath, <laughs> to, to not feel like you're complicit in that suffering. We all want to, you know, help people who are suffering, especially when they're in our presence. Well, this scene in The Women of Trachis is as much about the conflict that young person feels being asked to help his father die as it is the conflict of the person who's suffering, in this case, Heracles, who describes and voices in his suffering almost equally a will to live and a will to die at the same time. He wants to die as much as he wishes to live. And that was something we talked about with Doctors Without Borders yesterday, that that that's possible that um, one can both wish to die and wish to live as forcefully as the other in in the same moment, like almost like a chord of feelings that are contradictory. And again, here we are back in that incredibly ambiguous, gray, morally complex place that I would say characterizes adult life, that that's what it is. That's where we live. That's where we're currently living. And to reiterate, and we, I think we've kind of hit this, but I want to make, make this clear, the, the point that you make, that these, you can't read these plays and expect to find an answer to these problems. No, the answer is it, it's not in the play. The answer is in the audience. And that's to say the answer is in the collective act of bearing witness to war or to trauma or to loss. The answer is in the act of staying in the room, no matter how uncomfortable it gets. The answer, the action of the audience is not passively to listen, but to in our model, but I think in the ancient model too, to bear witness and to offer their interpretations and their, their truths and perspectives, even if they're radically different. I think that, that it's not coincidental that the center of Athenian democracy is a form that continues to reinforce over and over again our interdependence as human beings. And I think that's also at the heart of it. The plays depict situations that i you know frankly are pretty dispiriting and hopeless and fatalistic but that's not the end of the story the end of the story resides in what the audience chooses to do about it and i think in each story there's a fleeting possibility of making a change but what the greeks knew and what people who've been to war know and what people who've experienced loss know is that that possibility is not guaranteed and it is fragile, as fragile as human 
happiness or ex- our existence, and that we have to work really hard to remain conscious enough to take advantage of that opportunity to make a change before it's too late. And if we're not awake, if we're asleep at the wheel, we'll miss it. And we'll be like the characters in Greek tragedies, learning too late and then having to feel complicit, not just in our own suffering, but of generations to come. So people can read the tragedies, but as you said, these were made to be performed. Do you have any recommendations like on performances that people could watch or listen to? To help them get an idea. Yeah. What so this to be clear, like. yeah, we don't we don't release recorded versions of what we do because, as you probably gleaned from this conversation, what happens in the theater is about being present in the moment with other people. So it's the simultaneity of the experience and the risk proposition. The actors take the risk of performing Greek tragedy, you know, with minimal rehearsal in front of an audience that's been in the military, for instance made to watch it, you know, and then they call voluntold in the Greek, I mean, in the, in the military, voluntold in the military to watch the play. And you can actively see people um, thinking about how they could do us harm in the first five minutes. But but 45 minutes in, people are sharing their stories and they've taken ownership of the, the exchange of the ancient play and something transformative occurs. So we moved to a Zoom-based model in May of 2020 because of the pandemic. Our first performance was Oedipus the King, and we had 15,000 people tune in from 48 countries. And since then, we've presented 14, 15 other performances on Zoom across a whole series of tragedies, from Greek tragedy to Shakespearean tragedy to the Book of Job from the Old Testament. And we continue to do so. We have performances next week. And whenever this airs, there will be performances that week as well. Um, If you simply go to our website, theaterofwar.com, spelled the American way, E-R, theaterofwar.com, and you go on our schedule, you'll find all the upcoming events. All of our work is free, but our work takes place in the moment. It's not to be consumed. So you can't stream it or download it. You have to make the commitment of being present with other people who are experiencing it at the same time you are. And I recommend coming to see our work because we have an incredible cast of over 250 well-known actors who are at the top of their craft who weekly join our ranks to try their hand at these incredibly powerful and challenging plays and to learn from audiences who always know more than we do about what these plays are really about. Well, Brian, this has been a great conversation. Thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Brad. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for helping us spread the word and for taking a deeper dive into the book. I really appreciate it. My guest today was Brian Dorries. He's the author of the book, The Theater of War. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about his work at his website, theaterofwar.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash theaterofwar. We can find links to resources. We can delve deeper into this topic.